At City Light Church, we, we really love the scriptures. We love, we believe that they are God's word to us, uh, breathed by him, uh, authored by humans and by God in, in that kind of partnership, that they are or were two specific people in a specific time, in a specific location, uh, but they're also for us today. And so every week we like to open up the Bible and look into the scriptures and see what is God saying generally. Uh, so what, what is good, what is true, but then also what is God specifically saying maybe to us in our time, in our geography, in our context, in our culture, uh, in your neighbourhood, in your families, in your sporting clubs, uh, at, at your workplace, all of those kinds of things. And so uh, today we're going to be opening up the scriptures. We're going through this uh, letter in the Bible called 1 Corinthians, which is a letter written by a guy called Paul to a church in a place called Corinth, hence Corinthians, that's where the Corinthians lived. <clears throat> uh, we're, we're into chapter 2 today. And many of you, if not most of you, even just today, have already stood up and made a commitment that you would be there for one of nine or multiple of nine uh, young people and their families to example for them what it looks like to be a man or a woman pursuing Jesus, to speak to them words of life and words of wisdom, help them grow up into the likeness of Jesus, point them to Jesus uh, yourselves. And today's passage actually will really help you to do that. Not only that, so it's not just for that. It, it happens to be where we're up to. Uh, we didn't pick this passage for baby dedications. It happens to be where we're up to. Uh, I, don't wanna, I mean, I, I do want to talk it up too much to say this will help you in all of life. So I'm going to read this passage for you. Um, we'll pray and we'll ask God to help us understand what we have for us today. This is from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 to 16. This is what it says. We do, however, speak a wisdom among the mature, but not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. On the contrary, we speak God's hidden wisdom in a mystery, a wisdom God predestined before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age knew this wisdom because if they had known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no human heart is conceived. God has prepared these things for those who love him. Now God has revealed these things to us by the Spirit. Since the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except his Spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who comes from God. So that we may understand what has been freely given to us by God. We also speak these things, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual things to spiritual people. But the person without the Spirit does not receive what comes from God, from God's Spirit, because it's foolishness to him. He's not able to understand it since it's evaluated spiritually. The spiritual person, however, can evaluate everything, and yet he himself cannot be evaluated by anyone, for who has known the Lord's mind that he may instruct him? But we... Have the mind of Christ. Let's pray. So, Father, I want to thank you again for these scriptures, for Paul and the church there at Corinth, for Chloe and her people asking those questions, for the response that came and your spirit, your spirit's inspiration and prompting in the answer. And so, help us today to have open hearts, open minds, uh, receptive spirits to your Holy Spirit helping us to understand your scriptures so we go away understanding more of who you are, more of your character, more of your goodness, more of your kindness, more of your glory, and also more of how you relate to us, your thoughts about us, your thoughts about the world and how you'd have us live in it. And so help us. Even as I read, we have the mind of Christ. Father, help us to have the mind of Christ today. It's in his name we ask, amen. Uh, so if you're visiting with us, or you were here last week uh, and going through this letter of um, 1 Corinthians, one of the things that Paul has been setting up, all of chapter one is the glory of God, how amazing God is. God is totally otherly, majestic and glorious, 
far and above our ways, just totally far and above our ways. And yet, he condescends to relate with us, his creation, uh, tiny like specks of dust, of chaff on a rock floating in a vast expanse of the cosmos as a father. Not as little ants, but as a, as a loving father who comes to us in his son Jesus, saves us from our rebellion and our sin, and even saves us from death, brings us into his kingdom, into his family, even into union with himself. And he sets up this contrast between what was happening in Corinth at the time and, and throughout really Greece or even the Roman Empire at the time, which was this growing sophistry or growing uh, like influences that people would go to and gather around to tell them how should I live. And these people would be great at speaking, great at influencing. Uh, they would have fine oratory skills, eloquent speech, and a great worldly wisdom. And so people would come from all over the place to learn from these sophists, to learn how can I grow in wisdom. And what Paul does in chapter 1, the beginning of chapter 2, is he says, oh man, that, that wisdom, it might help you to know how to be a better boss, how to be a better worker, how to, you might have five tips to, you know, six-pack abs or something like this. He says, but that kind of worldly wisdom actually can't deal with your deepest issues. Our, our foundational problem is God is holy and just. He rules and reigns over all of creation. And if we are his enemies in our sin and rebellion, that is our most significant problem that no other problem even can hold a candle to that problem. And so he says, man, when I came to you, I didn't come with eloquence. I didn't come like the world does. I didn't come like an influencer trying to gain followers or prestige or money. I didn't have that kind of worldly wisdom that tickles your ears and makes you go, oh, I feel great. This is, a, this is a wonderful message. You're making me feel really good about myself. He says, no, 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 I came with a demonstration of God's power. And that is in the simple proclamation of Christ and him crucified and through the gospel, which is the power unto salvation, you are saved. And so he's setting up, this is what the world's trying to do. It's trying to attract you to the world by its wisdom that can't solve your problem. But what I came to you is with the offensive gospel. Actually, we are sinners. We don't deserve God's love. We, we are, I am not the king of my own life. I'm not amazing in my own right. I can't say to God, hey God, you should love me. Look how amazing I am. Although that is coming to be the dominant culture of our day today, 2024 in the West, in Australia. Is I'm, I'm perfect the way I am. However I want to be, whatever I want to do, you must accept me if you don't, you're hateful and bigoted, and how could a God not love me as I am right now? And Paul comes into a culture with a similar kind of morality. You, you do you, let me do me. And you do you, and I'll do me, and that's fine until we come to you know, loggerheads, and then you must say that I am. I'm good as I am. And the gospel comes in and says, we are enemies of God, subjects of his wrath. No worldly wisdom. There's no eight steps to being right with God that I can follow, plug myself into the algorithm and end up with God saying, you did it. You have climbed the moral ladder. You have balanced the karmic scales. You have done it. You can't do it. And so Paul says, we do not look to wisdom. 
But then he goes on to the next part and he says, let me tell you a little bit more about wisdom. He goes, because it might sound like I'm saying wisdom's no good. He said, I didn't come with wisdom, uh, you know, worldly wisdom, not great. But he comes in and says, there's a different kind of wisdom. We do need wisdom. If you are going to live a life congruent with your union with Jesus, a life pleasing to God that you can now live, that you are in Christ, you're going to need wisdom. He talks about where real wisdom comes from. He says, we speak God's hidden wisdom in a mystery, a wisdom God predestined before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age knew this wisdom because if they had known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So again, he's talking about the gospel. He's not trying to set up some, he's not saying we've got secret knowledge, abstract of the gospel, so you get the gospel, but then you graduate to the secret knowledge. He's saying this is the hidden mystery from God, predestined from the ages past. It was his plan from the very beginning, before Adam and Eve ate the fruit. This was his plan, that he would come and redeem and restore the world through his precious son, Jesus. The good news in his power unto salvation. This is the true wisdom. And he's saying, man, if the rulers of the world, if the sophists, if the, if the rulers, if the governors, if they had known wisdom, all the ones that we hold up and say, here are the wise, rule us, tell us how we should live, tell us what I should believe. If they had real wisdom, they wouldn't have murdered Jesus, is what Paul's saying. He's saying, you know that their wisdom is lacking because they wouldn't have acted the way they did if they had had wisdom. So we need wisdom. He's helping us realize that political power isn't a stand-in for wisdom. Social proof, how many followers an influencer has, is not a measure of their wisdom. How good their record sales are, how eloquent the poetry of their lyrics, how good they are at sport, is not a stand-in for wisdom. You can be world class at governing and unwise in the things that truly matter. You could be a chart topper and unwise. You could be a, an elite athlete and unwise. You can have a billion followers and not be wise in the thing that truly matters. How do they miss this wisdom? He tells us. Verse 11 to 13, Paul discusses the capability of spiritual discernment can only be discerned spiritually, only by the Holy Spirit. It's the only way someone can... Paul writes this to the Romans. He says, uh, only by faith. It's only in the power of the Holy Spirit that somebody can say, Jesus is Lord. Now, anybody can mouth those three words. Anyone can vocalize those things. But the only people who can say that with faith are those who have been gifted faith by the Holy Spirit. So Paul writes to the Ephesians. He said, you've been saved by grace. That's a gift. Through faith, to be able to receive that gift of, gift of grace. And he says, and even that faith itself is a gift so that nobody can boast. So that nobody says, I did it. My wisdom, my way. I pulled myself up and climbed that ladder and I reached up to heaven. Nobody can do it, he says. They can only be discerned spiritually. And these truths are foolishness to those who don't have the Holy Spirit. So here's the difficulty. Because for people who have the Holy Spirit, people who are in Christ, we don't, we don't lord it over people as if we've attained some sort of moral superiority. We don't look down on people who don't have the Holy Spirit, as if we have earned something, as if we have deserved something. We look down at people and say, oh, uh, I have the superior knowledge. You don't have it because you don't have the Holy Spirit. Oh, it's foolishness to them. They can't receive it. It's impossible. Apart from the Holy Spirit's power in the proclamation of the gospel. So Paul writes, what no eye has seen, he's quoting Isaiah, what no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no human heart has conceived, God has prepared these things for those who love him. Those who love him. 
So the things that we can't manufacture ourselves, we can't make up, we can't awaken to these spiritual realities apart from God, apart from the Holy Spirit. We can't do it. It says God has prepared this wisdom from eternity past. It was always his plan. And he finishes this. This is extraordinary to me. For those who love him for their glory. We've got to be careful when we read a phrase like this that we don't fall into a ditch on, on, uh, on either side. On the one hand, when we look at God is doing something for our glory, and what, if we err too much in this direction, we might say, well, this is, of course God is for my glory. And we become more of a, a self-glorifying person or people. We make it all about me. God is really all about me. And as we read in Scripture, we're reading all the bits that are really about God's glory, but we turn them in on ourselves and say, this is about me. And not just in a way that I get caught up in God's glory and God's plan and how wonderful God is towards me, and how loving God is towards me, and that I'm, I'm caught up in his glory, but in actual fact that, that my glory is somehow the, the point. I watched a sermon, there was a, a, a bit of a sermon um, uh, went viral about a month ago online where this preacher was saying, essentially, how amazing is it that God worships us? And I was like, you idiot. That's, it's foolishness. It's dangerous for him, for his listeners. But it's exactly what the dominant culture is telling us. Of course God is for you. Whatever you want to do, of course God wants that. And it seeps into the church because we love to hear that. Our flesh loves to hear that. I don't have to change. I don't have to do anything. I might not even be a sinner. Of course God loves me. It's foolishness. On the other side of the ditch is this kind of pseudo-humility, which is also false, that rejects the idea that God would glorify us at all. So we parts of the scripture that talk about God only being for God's glory. And we need to say amen to that without neglecting where Paul also writes that God is working for your glory. What does that mean? How, what does it look like? Let's look at other parts of Scripture where it talks about the part of God's plan about bringing us to glory. Like Colossians 3, where Paul writes, When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Romans 8, those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Or Jesus, John 17, the high priestly prayer, praying to his Father where he, he prays, I have given them the glory you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. So here's the deal. There's others. Romans 8, 17, Hebrews 2. There's many other points, there's many other places, but the point is this, that we, God alone is glorious. But God so desires relationship with us that he draws us into union with him in Christ. And if we are unified with him, if we are in him, then we must also be glorious. So we don't want to fall into either of these ditches by saying, of course I'm glorious, or no, I can't be glorious. We are united with Christ in his glory and made glorious. It's amazing. It's wonderful. And you might think about that and go, but I don't feel, I'm not glorious. I know, I know my sin, I know my nature, I know my thoughts. But this is the beauty and the power of the gospel that all of our sin has been dealt with on the cross of Christ. All of our shame has been dealt with. Every sin, every stain has been blotted out. You've been made pure and blameless and spotless by the precious blood of Christ. This is 
the wonder of the gospel. The God, he brings us into his glory. Romans 8, Paul writes, if, if we are children, we're also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with, with, suffer with him, so that we also may be glorified with him. And so we are united with him in his glory. We're also united with him in his suffering. And we're united with him in his love, the love that the Father has for the Son, is the love that the Father has for you and for me because we're in the Son. It's wonderful. The honour God has gifted to us, bestowed upon us in our union with Jesus. This is something that we need to think about every day. It changes our entire life. It changes every aspect of how we think about ourselves, how we, how we speak to others, Changes how we relate to God, where we do not come groveling to God, although he is all-powerful and almighty and totally glorious because he's made us one with him in Christ. And he's dealt with everything necessary to make that happen. So he's dealt with our sin, dealt with our rebellion, and he has made us glorious like him. How do we know these things? He says, now, God has revealed these things to us by the Spirit. Paul writes to the Colossians and he says, I want their hearts to be encouraged and joined together in love so that they may all have, sorry, so that they may have all the riches of complete understanding and have the knowledge of God's mystery, Christ, in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And in our passage today, he talks about the Spirit searching the depths of God. Much like our own Spirit comprehends our own thoughts. This speaks to the, the unity the Spirit, God the Spirit and God the Father and God the Son have together. There's nothing the Father knows or the Spirit doesn't know. The Spirit knows the Father totally because... The Father and the Spirit are one. Distinct persons, one nature. And the Spirit tells us the thoughts of God. It's the only way we can know them. It's the only way we can receive these is when the Spirit tells us. It's the same Spirit that lives in you. It's the same Spirit we have living in us as a guarantee, as a deposit, of the things that God has, has claimed over us and done for us in Christ is also the same spirit that reveals all of these things, gifts us the faith with which to receive the grace by which we can say, Jesus is Lord. He's my saviour. He's my brother. He's my friend. John 16, Jesus says, When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own. He will speak whatever he hears. And so he finishes this thought by saying, and so we have the mind of Christ. So we think like Jesus. So we don't know everything that Jesus knows, but we can know the truth like Jesus knows the truth. He is the author of truth. He is the truth. He says, I am the truth. I am the way. I am the life. That's what Jesus says. It's because we have his mind. We have... We're united with him. We gain the mind of Christ. It means we can now think rightly about who we are. We can think rightly about who God is. We can think rightly about others. And we can speak rightly. We can speak truthfully. And not just speak a truth that's worldly wisdom, but speak a truth in the power of the Holy Spirit that can only come from the Holy Spirit. And that is the power unto salvation, the gospel of Jesus. God loves you. He loves me. 
If you're visiting today, you're, here, you're thinking, yeah, I'm going to come and see my friend's baby get dedicated and then have some great food and go to Mother's Day lunch and then bait and switch. Here's this dude speaking to me for 25 minutes. Uh, I hope you understand. God loves you. Even in this passage, in another passage we saw today, it says he predestined, he knew, he decided before the foundation of the earth, before the first human walked, he decided, I'm going to send Jesus. I'm going to redeem and restore people to myself, a family, sons and daughters, in glory, for eternity. And I fully believe that you are here today because he, in his sovereignty, in his providence, has brought you here to hear from me about how much he loves you. And my hope and my prayer for you is that the Spirit is at work in you so that you can hear this and not think that's foolishness and I will reject it, but that you will receive the gift of grace, not going away and getting your life in order so that you can balance the karmic scales or reach up to God, but know that he has already in Christ reached down to us. He's already dealt with all of your sin, everything you've done, everything you'll do, every thought and activity, every careless word covered by the blood of Jesus. So there's nothing left for you to do but to receive that gift. Let's pray together. So Father, I want to thank you for your kindness to us in Jesus. You're so good to us. Help us to have the mindset of Jesus who, being in the very nature God, didn't consider equality with you something to be used to to his own advantage, but rather made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Before the joy set before him, went to that cross so that we might be saved. You might be glorified in us and we might be glorified in you. You're so good to us. Please, Father, help us to have the mind of Christ to grow in the mind of Christ. Help us, like we made commitments earlier, uh, to speak words, not just of earthly wisdom that may help today, but especially the spiritual wisdom that comes from you that is a help for forever. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. So we're going to gather around the table. We're going, to, we're going to remember Jesus, what he's done for us, how good he is to us. If you're ever wondering and you're thinking, man, but my sin is too great. Uh, my, I am too far gone. I'm too far down. What we do is we consider how stark, how wonderful the love of Jesus is, which is why every week we take the bread to remind ourselves, ourselves of his body, in which he paid the penalty for our sin he died. We take the cup to remember his blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. That God doesn't look at you and see a list of failures and faults of, of sin and rebellion. He sees beloved daughter, beloved son. That we don't uh, grovel or like obsequiously or kind of, we don't kind of, you know, hesitantly come before God and say, is he going to accept me? but we see what Jesus has done, that he has earned what we couldn't earn. And he has paid a penalty that we deserve. So we don't have to do either because he's gifted them to us. And so we come boldly before the throne of God as a daughter or as a son. We say, thank you, praise you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. If you're here today, you're not in Christ. Um, I want to say, man, I'm so glad that you're here. And this is, again, it's not, we're not Christians because we're super clever or discovered something, some cosmic loophole, but because God loves us. He loves to draw people to himself through the proclamation of the gospel. And you've heard the gospel and you can respond to the gospel today. Just ask the person who brought you along, come speak with me afterwards. We'd love to help you understand how to walk in the liberty of the gospel of Jesus. Walking right with God for forever. It's wonderful. If you're here today, you're in Christ. Even if you're visiting, you're welcome to come gather on the table because, man, we love worshipping our King Jesus. 
remembering what he's done for us and in obedience gathering around the table together, that we're all going to lift up our voices and sing to the King who loves us. Let's do it.